If you're trying to make any kind of meaningful, effective change in your life, you've come to the right place. Good day, ladies and gents. Welcome back to another episode of We're Talking Shift. Today, I have a little compilation of clips from a few episodes that I've done over the past year focusing on different aspects of mental and emotional health. This first clip that you're going to see is from episode 94 when the renowned Dr. Srikumar Rao and I talked about cultivating resilience and becoming radiantly alive. Every day you ought to get up and your blood is sinking at the thought of being who you are and doing what you do. That if your life is not like that, where you're not radiantly alive, at least some of the time, mm. you're wasting your life. And life is altogether too short to waste. That's why I get, I don't particularly like the name, the happiness guru, but you know, it's kind of found its way there and it sticks. So it's, it could be worse, right? <laughs> it could be a lot worse, yes. That's, that's not a bad title to be stuck with, I don't think, Dr. Rao. <laughs> So, so what, um, okay, so let's start with, for me, and I, I'm sure for you, it, it, there's a, I believe that it always, it's got to shift in your mind first, the way that you're thinking about things, yes. right? The meaning you're applying to things. So when, when we talk about ways to become more alive, radiantly alive, as you say, um, what do they have to start? What do people have to start shifting? Are there some core concepts that we can help them with to make that mental shift? Because it's got to start inside before anything, you know, outside. Oh, absolutely. Right. <clears throat> the first important concept I want to share with your listeners is we have this thing called mental chatter. Mental chatter is an internal monologue that's always in our mind. It begins when we get up in the morning, is with us throughout the day, and uh, is, in fact, with everyone right now. The kind of thing that goes, what is this mental chatter? Do I really have it? What is this guy saying? Can I? It's all mental chatter. Now, the problem with mental chatter is we ignore it because it's there. It's like an unwelcome relative who's shown up at your house and you can't throw him out. So we live, we live our lives in spite of our mental shatters, try to suppress it, ignore it, work around it. And that's a big mistake because we create our life with our mental chatter. We think we live in a real world. We don't. We live in a construct and we make that construct with our mental chatter. That's what persons don't recognize. Let me give you an example. This is a very uh, important teaching of the Buddha. And I'm going to narrate the parable of the second arrow. And the Buddha asked his disciple, Ananda, Ananda, if an arrow would have hit you in the arm, would it not be very painful? Alpha Lord said, yes, Lord, it would be very painful. And if a second arrow would have hit you exactly where the first arrow hit you, would it not be even more painful? Lord said, yes, Lord, it would be even more painful. And the Buddha asked, why then do you shoot the second arrow? Now that confuses most people when they hear it, <clears throat> so I have to elaborate. So let me elaborate by means of an example. So there was this mother, and she was a very good, loving mother, and her son turned 16, he got his provisional driver's license, and one day he comes up to his mother all excited and says, hey mom, I'm going to meet a bunch of my friends, and can I take the car? The mother says, of course not, you just got your driver's provisional license, uh, driver's license, you're not yet ready to drive. Where do you have to go? I'll drop you. He says, no, no, mom, you don't understand. You can't be there. So he said, okay, fine, there's Uber, there's Lyft, what do you want to do? No, 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 you don't understand. You can't be there and I have to take the car. It's very important that I have to take the car and you can't be there. So she says, no, but you know how children are, he begs, he pleads, he wheedles, and bit by bit, she feels herself giving way, and she takes promises for him, no beer, no drinking, no, no, mom, no drinking, and you'll be back by 10 o'clock, yes, and you'll call, yes. So finally, reluctantly, she gives him the keys. And of course, once he gets the keys, he forgets all about his promises, he forgets to call home, forgets about the curfew, drinks too much. On the way back, he has a serious accident, has to be operated on immediately, and his mother is there in the you know, hospital while he's being operated on. And then they wheel him out to the recovery room, and she rushes home to take a quick shower so she can go back. And at that time, her friend calls. And the friend says, 
what kind of a mother are you? How could you possibly have let him take the car? You're not a mother, you're a murderer. Now, you'd be shocked, right? That a friend would say something like this at a time like that. Right. You'd probably be much less shocked if I told you it wasn't the friend who said that, it's what she told herself. Mm. That is the second arrow. The second arrow. The second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. That's the important thing to remember. The second arrow is mm. always delivered by means of mental chatter. It's bad enough that her son has had a serious accident and has been operated on, telling herself she's a lousy mother, she's a murderer, and the many ways in which she failed. Does it make things in any way better? But we do it not. all the time. Right. So one of the ways to consider, no matter what situation you're facing, your mental chatter about that situation makes it at least an order of magnitude worse. For all the persons who come to me for coaching, for all the persons who come to me, my programs, if I could get them to stop at the second arrows, they'd be much better off. Most of the time, they're already on the 25th or 510th arrows. <laughs> I've had that experience as well with many of my clients. And so I, I, I say hashtag MYM, and that's my, my thing for mind your mind. It's yes. This, it's this exercise and this practice on learning how to mind your mind, or right? Because those thoughts, that mental chatter that you're talking about, and those thoughts that we keep allowing to just do whatever they want and go wherever they want in our minds – ends up creating, you know, our emotions and how we feel and how yes. we're looking at everything. And Complete. Um, MYM, I like that hashtag. I'm going to steal that right you, away. You, well, <laughs> be my guest, please. I will be honored for you to steal my hashtag, <laughs> Dr. Rao. Uh, so yes, hashtag MYM, mind your mind. Because, you know, if you look at it like, like attracts like, and you think about the thoughts that, that you consistently think, if, if you are consistently thinking negative or disempowering or fearful thoughts, those thoughts go out and they invite all of their friends in, yes. like attracts like, and then it just becomes a big party and community of those same types of thoughts. And then your life unfolds accordingly, right? Exactly true. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's important people listen to don't don't keep shooting arrows in your arm. <laughs> don't shoot second arrows. <laughs> the first is bad enough. <laughs> well, you all heard it right there. Dr. Rao loved my quote, mind your mind so much that he said he was going to steal it, which of course I am honored if he steals any of my quotes. That's pretty cool. All right, so to listen to the whole episode with Dr. Rao, make sure to go back and listen to the entire episode 94, you guys. There's so much good stuff there, you're gonna love it. Okay, in this next episode, I'm sharing a few minutes of a conversation I had with my frequent and one of my all-time favorite guests, Tommy John. We got into a deep conversation, and I mean deep, around mental health, and uh, well, TJ shared a very, very personal story that, well, sadly, a lot of people will be able to relate to, but there's some really, really good tips here. Uh, I don't want you to miss it. So here we go with a clip from episode 95 with Tommy John. Uh, right, our emotional, our psychological, our, our social well-being, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Yeah, our right. thoughts and feelings and then our perception into everything. I, it, it addresses everything. We have feelings towards everything. So it's interwoven into every aspect of our, of our lives. Right, right. It, it affects how we handle stress and make decisions and everything. So I just wanted to get really clear on that before yeah. we jump into, um, you know, to a serious topic. But I, I mean, mental health issues are nothing new. But of course, um, given what's going on right now, it's like things are escalating. So in, in, in the time of, of, of COVID-19, we have got anxiety and depression and drug use. All of this stuff is skyrocketing. Um, people are getting desperate. And as you and I both know, desperate people do desperate things and they're not always the right things. I, uh, 
just in the last 12 hours, gentleman's 18 year old daughter started getting professional help speaking with a therapist because she's expressing massive loneliness, massive depression with our response to the current pandemic. That's, that's one. Another girl in Australia, she lives in Tulum, Mexico. She's from the UK, I believe. Tons of friends in London and Australia. Um, I think acquaintances and friends, uh, seven suicides. Seven. I don't know. I, I haven't seen seven movies that had a suicide in it. You, you know what I mean? Like, I don't even know how to even gauge that. I, I didn't know what to say. I'm like, I, this, is, this is unbelievable. And then it's just timely that we're doing this topic today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was looking at some stats um, that I'm going to read just a couple of days ago. Um, since the COVID lockdown began, many states have seen a huge rise in opioid overdoses. Um, Americans are taking more anti-anxiety medications and antidepressants. Uh, the anti-anxiety prescriptions rose by 34%. Okay. That's insane. Um, antidepressant prescriptions jumped by over 18%. Now that's just on those couple of things. I didn't, right. I didn't right. dig for all the other um, right. you know, crazy stuff that's going on out there, but those are pretty frightening stats right now. And you know, here's the thing, I'm, I'm wondering how many people that are now um, doing you know, t telemedicine with their doctors, yeah. so they can't even like take their blood pressure and any no. other stats, right? They're just saying, I'm depressed or I'm anxious, I'm stressed, and they're getting prescriptions. So how many of these people now, once this um, time frame that we're in passes, and at some point it will, right. once it passes, how many of these people are going to be now dependent on that? And you know, what is that, what is that looking like? It's, uh, it's frightening. I know, and that fallout. I, that's why I, I don't think we're looking at, at this the, the appropriate way, regardless of where you sit on what's going on right now, how we're handling it. I, I, I honestly kind of wish it was just a virus, even a man-made lethal, like make the most potent, because what we're going to have to deal with after this to either wean people off certain medications from their fallout or families having to repair after suicides or, or dealing with family loss um, coming out after this, like, great, the virus is gone. I don't have a sister and we don't have our business and we don't have, you know what I mean? Like, great, we survived this. The biggest, the scariest, this is the part that just breaks my heart are, we're talking about these words. Everybody I'm sure is, is in their minds picturing an adult going through this, but it's, it's children. <laughs> that's the biggest component that I, that yeah. I think is, that's the, that's the part that, that really gets me that we need to focus on for sure. Yeah, it's awful. Um, and, and I've known a few, <clears throat> uh, some younger people, yeah. not, not necessarily children personally, although I know that that's a huge problem right now with, with children being afraid out of their minds. But even teenagers, older teenagers, um, just having this hopelessness about, you know, what's happening? What are we doing? And, um, and suicide has come up. Uh, as a topic for a lot of these people. And that's just, it's, it's a big damn deal. And I yeah. remembered your story um, about your brother. Yeah. And, in, you know, there's a lot of uh, connective tissue here with between that and some of the stuff that we're talking about. So I know it's a tough one, but you want to talk about your brother's story? Yeah, absolutely. So he, uh, first of all, when I, when I'm speaking about this person, who's my brother, he, if you could picture, he was my best friend, right? Like, like, so that person, we all have our best friends in our lives. Now throw that it's also your brother. Um, so our temperaments, our styles, our tastes, our sense of humors, our personalities. He, he, was, he was a little more gentler and a little steady on the calm meter. He, he rarely went up, um, which I, I, I respected and honored in that. I always looked up to him to that. but. Um, he started to, we noticed, my mom noticed he was cutting. He had some slashes on his arm, pretty common. Um, we thought we could go get him from Charlotte, North Carolina, bring him out to Chicago to live with my sister and I near us, just a different environment. And that, that somehow just changing the environment, you'd, you, you'd be fine. He'd be fine. He'd be safe. And right. he How came old was out he at and, this time? 
What's that? TJ, how old was he at this time? This was like he 10 was, years ago, right? Uh, he was 26. Okay. He was 26 years old. And so 25 years old. And so um, he comes out and then, then came his first, I mean, he, he gets a job. He's hanging out with his family of the side of the family that were really open and really, you know, non-judgmental. And, and it, it's like a, like a real healthy family dynamic. You know, he's starting to see stuff. My sister took him in as a son, really, when she's got her own family. I, I, what my sister did for him is incredible, but um, kind of showed him the ropes on certain things. And then nothing's resolved. You know, there's still the, the underlying factors, just like injuries have underlying factors, um, you know, all sorts of the ways the body expresses, it needs help. There's, there's reasons it needs help. And we didn't really pay attention to those because we didn't really know what was going on, right? And so then all of a sudden he disappears one day and we use the, the help of the Chicago Bears. My brother-in-law played with the Bears. So we used their, their links to the FBI, some other things, right? We pulled some strings and found him in a hotel in Indiana and he had done sleeping pills and alcohol a real kind of real benign way to sort of attempt to kill yourself. I know it sounds really grotesque, but um, once that happened, he's now admitted into the ER and now you're in this stream. And, and when the Western medical model of psychiatry takes you into that stream and you have that label, you're in that label and you're in that stream and he's, you know, whatever it was, manic, depressive, bipolar, like whatever the labels were. Um, he was on lithium. He was on Seroquel. He was on some really crazy antipsychotic uh, medications. And so it was this up and down battle over the next four years of his life, trying to manage the meds, which is fairly sort of Russian roulette style. Um, yeah. And I saw, I saw some really great days. I saw some mania, mania days and I saw some real low days. He made four, three more attempts on his life, each one getting more sort of grotesque. If, if, if you want details or whatever, we can go into them. Um, to me, there were, there were nothing because I'd seen, you, you know, you're looking through like the, the source of it. Like if he's covered in mud, I know the soul inside is a clean, really decent. So, you know, so we go into and there's blood and there's some experience. And it's like, wait, ah, no, nah, this is all just like almost costume fluff. There he is. There's my brother. All right. He's all right. Um, and he ended up having after the last attempt, which, which doesn't take him because he knows how to, how to really cross over and end his life. If he wanted to, he could take a certain combination of medications that would end him in minutes or mm -hmm. he could, you know, hang yourself or shoot yourself. I mean, it's scary just to talk like this, but I'm, I'm real open. So I apologize if this is, you know, too much for people, but, um, no, I think more it's people good, are, though, because we I, it, want people to be watching and aware because almost everybody knows somebody or knows right. somebody that has right. somebody close to them. And so you want to know, what are you watching for? What are the signs? And what are some of the things that, like we should talk about? Like I've, I've talked about this at dinner tables in public and everybody's kind of like looked at me, like, are we really talking about this? It's a human thing that a hundred percent of us are dealing with hundred percent of us know somebody who knows somebody or immediately in our home. It's, yeah. it's for sure. Or you're going to at some point. Um, he ended up, uh, stabilized over the evening. I dropped him off at the ER and then at six 30 in the morning, he had a seizure and passed away. And the nurse called me the next day. And, um, that was the end of his life. And it was, or, or a leveling up of his life, depending on where you look at it, you know, I, he's definitely somewhere better. Um, but, uh, that was, that was trying to, trying to connect the dots with, I'm a real big, I'm not, if I got hit by a, a drunk driver, I'd be like, why did that happen? You, you know what I mean? I try to figure out a way to get better from that. Not like I want to eliminate every drunk driver in the world and we should never No, I want to figure out like what, what is one way I can level up through this? Same with COVID right now, right? How can I get better? So it's trying to tell his story and some of the deeper, deeper details to it to let everybody know they're not alone. And this is just as important as stretching, biking, eating greens, you know, it is yeah. a huge component to what we need to talk about. We need to be open with this. Okay, you guys, that whole episode was just amazing, as are just about all of my convos with Tommy John. So I know you're going to want to go back and listen to it in its entirety. Again, that was episode 95.
Now this next episode is one in which I talk about another way of up-leveling your mental and emotional health and why it should be a priority above anything else. I dive deep into developing your inner power and once you learn how to develop it, it will set you free. So here's a clip from episode 112 about developing inner power. I was giving my past and others power over me. This is where the power comes in. I could no longer live with the stench of my own anger and had to do what seemed impossible, forgive them. So by making the choice to forgive, I took the power of unforgiveness and to, or, or I, um, I took away, I should say, the power of unforgiveness and took back my life. What freedom I experienced when I did. People have asked me over the years how I was able to stay so positive about life in prison and forgiveness is a big part of my answer. Being able to forgive gave me back my life. So that's why that's kind of the last big one that just sums it up so beautifully right there. The what if the person that we have to forgive is ourself? Mm -hmm. Something that we've done that caused issues in our lives or, um, you know, letting, giving away our power and letting people make us feel a certain way. What if we have to move on and forgive us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it's every bit as important that you forgive yourself, you know, and it's a process. It's not something like, okay, I've been beating myself up about this thing I did or said, you know, um, for 10 years now, I'm going to let it go uh, on Saturday. I mean, it's, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, that would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice, but it, it's usually not like flipping a switch. You know, usually there are other layers of, of work that you're doing and, but it really does take a big mindset shift. You have to be willing to stop punishing yourself because the punishment is eroding at your self-worth. And if you can turn it around and let it go, you have then the gift of, the of the message of what you've learned of how you've overcome to help other people but you can't help other people um you know effectively if you are still um basically keeping yourself in a place of you know i'm a piece of crap this is what i did it's unforgivable and i'll i'll never get over it nor should i i don't deserve to now what you've done is you've completely um, you've destroyed the, um, the story that you could have moving forward. You've taken away the power of creating a better future for yourself and other people. So, so learning, um, you know, learning some things, you might have to work with somebody to help you go through some processes of slowly learning to forgive yourself. And a lot of times that, comes with um, finding where the blessing could be. There's always, you know, the, the gift when you get to the other side of that is you have so much to give other people. That's exactly what, um, you know, Afterlife and Alice Marie Johnson is talking about. Her mistakes that she made that landed her there in the first place, it took her a long time and lots of work going through different levels of, you know, how is she going to be, you know, um, thinking about things differently? What, you know, how is she contributing even in, even in prison? How is she contributing in trying to make the lives of other people better. And as she got more and more involved in that and became, and became just this whole um, new version of herself, but then somebody brought this up and then she realized, ooh, there was still some stuff down there that she hadn't attended to yet. Um, you know, and when this she, but, but see, by then she was ready. You have to be ready you know, to get to that point. So sometimes there are some steps that have to happen first in order to be able to forgive yourself or somebody else. You got to be ready. So you got to get ready to get ready, if that makes sense. It, it does. Like this is a huge takeaway, I feel like, because when we're in that mindset where we're punishing ourselves, it's because we feel like we deserve it, right? And so if we could take that focus off of us 
and say, no, 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 you're also doing everyone else a disservice by punishing yourself. You're punishing exactly. everyone else because you're not sharing your gifts or whatever it may be. That makes it a lot easier yeah. to, to get out of yeah. that mindset. Wow. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be willing. And, and uh, a neat little phrase is, how can I make my mess my message? And so when you can make your mess your message and turn that into something that is not all um, focused on, only on you, and instead now you're going to focus on contributing to the betterment of others, to teaching others, to, to uplifting others, that's a whole new world that you can experience, a whole new story you can create for yourself. And it's going to feel good because when you are contributing, you are fulfilling one of the highest needs of the soul is to contribute. So, so when you, everybody makes mistakes and everybody makes, you know, bad choices uh, to some degree or other, obviously there's a, you know, <laughs> there's a big scale there, but if you have the opportunity to contribute in some way based on you have learned a lesson and you've become a better person for it and now you can help others, that's a, that's a pretty good place to be. Yeah, that, that would be a big shift. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, you know, the takeaway from that is, is nurturing resentments or revenge, mm -hmm. whether it's toward, you know, yourself or somebody else, it, it really makes you a prisoner of the past and, and it continues to then seed the power to whoever wronged you or whatever wrong you've done in the past. It's, it's all seeding power to the past. <laughs> And, and we want to move on from the past. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm expecting my future to be a lot better than the past. So yes. learn. <laughs> let's put know. that in the rear view mirror. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> learn, take the blessing and move on. Right. <laughs> okay. So now, um, now that you know many of the ways that we give our power away and the downsides, um, this is important to know because when, when you don't own your power, it makes it easy for other people to own you. And that is why it's so important to understand, to recognize some of these ways that you may not realize you're giving away your power. It's really important to recognize what you're doing to give it away. And then in a second, we're going to talk about how you can start to develop it. But that's why, because otherwise other people own you because they can manipulate you. They can man manipulate your emotions. And that's what's going on. This whole entire year of 2020 has been a big fat manipulation of everyone's <laughs> emotions through the media. I don't care what side you're on. So you better really be able to understand how to stand strong in your power so that you are not moved around like a pawn on a chessboard. Oh, and Lori, as a, you know, I consider myself a journalist. And so I have to say those people who are being affected by the media, they're giving the media their power. It's not our fault. Right. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's talk about some ways that we can develop and exercise our power. Um, Here's the thing. It's hard. And this is why it's, this is actually why it's more difficult for a lot of young people. I think it's hard to find and stand in your power. If you haven't closely examined uh, the qualities and the characteristics that you value. So you have to kind of start at the beginning at the fabric of who you are and who you want to be. Right? So we have to start, as you've heard me say many times before, by asking ourselves some quality questions. And that would be like, well, what kind of person do I want to be? What kind of person do I not want to be? What characteristic traits do I want to embody? What are my values? What are my beliefs? What are my morals? Um, Am I treating myself? Am I treating my life uh, with, with dignity and respect? These are some basic fundamental questions that you got to sit down and get really real with yourself about. Um, what are the standards that I hold myself to when it comes to uh, what is and is not acceptable uh, to me in the ways that I want to behave and experience life? So those right there, I mean, if you sit down and even just start answering those questions, you're going to get to know yourself a lot better. Uh, 
But if you don't even ask yourself the questions, if you don't even sit down and make a list of what actually are my values, my core values, what are the characteristics in, in a person um, that I admire, that I want to have those same characteristics and personality traits, you know, what is important to me? Uh, if you haven't done that, then it's just really easy for you to be yanked around by, you know, whichever way the wind is blowing. You have nothing right. to stand on. All right, there you have it. If you don't want to be a prisoner of the past, this episode will help you learn how to break out of it. So make sure you go back and check out the whole show, number 112. And finally, we cap off this best of episode with a couple more tips on how to mind your mind and become mentally resilient. It is episode 115, and here we go. So when, um, when things are starting to get to you, again, because this is about mental strength, you guys, mental resilience, minding your mind, when, when things are starting to get to you and you feel like, uh, you know, you're just, you're starting to feel a little buried, be in the moment. And by being in the moment, you come back to one technique that works really well is to come back to your five senses. So usually what happens when people are getting super stressed um, in a state of fear, in a state of negativity, they have, they're not minding their minds. They've let their minds run away with them. Their thoughts run away with them. And they're- Spiral, I call right. it, the spiral. It, yes, yes. So to, to come back and to try to get a handle on that, we literally can come back into our five senses, you know, as a, as a human being. Um, what, am I, what am I feeling right now? What am I smelling? What am I tasting? What am I hearing? You know, come back to your body. And so that you're back here in the present moment and not like whatever you're dwelling on from the past or whatever fear you're dwelling on about a future scenario, you come back to what's really happening right in the moment. And then you ask yourself, well, all right, to get out of this state of fear, anxiety, or, you know, feeling buried, you know, am I actually okay right now? I'm breathing, you know, I'm not on fire. I'm not bleeding. Everybody's fine. I'm just scared. Right. So mm -hmm. am I okay right now? If you are check, um, uh, am I in any imminent danger right now? If you're not okay, check, um, what's good about this moment. Ooh, that's a good one. Right. Because then again, we're shifting the focus from whatever the state of fear, anxiety is to actually what's right or what's okay or what's good about the moment. So maybe what's good is that, well, yeah, um, I'm still got a roof over my head. I still have food in my refrigerator. I still am capable, you know, just sometimes you got to bring it back down to the very basics and the fundamentals. What is good about right now? My kids are fine. You know, my partner's fine or I'm fine. Mm. So bringing, keeping it simple. Um, what's one thing I can be thankful for? So you go beyond what's even good, but what can I be grateful for? That's always a good stay in the moment. Come back to now. Um, God, I, God, I was just, I had another one I was going to say, and I just, I lost it. It'll come back to me in a minute. <laughs> well, to give people a, a great example, if there's any Real Housewives of Orange County fans out there, I actually saw one of them doing this with another one a couple weeks ago. You know, she was really um, having just about an anxiety attack. And um, the other woman started asking her, well, what do you smell right now? What do you see? And I'm like, what is she doing? Like, mm. you know, oh, now Bronwyn thinks she's a therapist. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I love her. She's one of my faves. Uh, but I just thought, what the heck is she doing? And now mm -hmm. to hear from um, someone who definitely knows what she's talking about, that that could be a great technique. It's, it's making sense to me now. Yeah. Yeah. So she was trying to get her to shift what her mind, what she was dwelling on back into what's actually reality right now in the moment. What, yeah. a, what, a cool, it, what a cool trick. I want to call it a trick, but um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it's a technique. It <laughs> you can call it a trick. It's a, it's a technique though. And, it's, and that's also a good technique for people that are trying to learn to meditate because the problem most people have, the problem we all have is trying to you know, manage our thoughts and not be thinking about all kinds of stuff when you're trying to just you know, be still and receive whatever it is you know, you're trying to receive. And it's really hard to turn our brains off and our thoughts. So one way to help do that is to use that technique of what am I feeling? 
you know, in all of the parts of my body, bringing your attention to your body, bringing your attention to your breathing. So it's a really helpful technique in, and has a lot of applications, shall we say. I know what I was going to, I was just going to point out, this is another time to, when you're trying to stay in the moment to ask yourself, the, those are quality questions. So we're back to quality questions always. Once you start doing a, uh, an inquisition on yourself, asking some really good questions to help you get back in the moment and not feel like you are getting lost in fearful scenarios that maybe haven't, that haven't even happened. Right. And, and it's not a scary thing. You're not asking us to harass ourselves or say, you know, why are you being such an idiot? You right. know, right. It, it's not, that certainly wouldn't be a quality question. No, no, that would <laughs> definitely... <laughs> No, uh, we'll talk about that on uh, one of the other uh, ones. <laughs> but yeah, because it, it's not an inquisition or an accusation, it's inquiry. And there's, a di there's a difference, right? You're not trying to um, you know, beat yourself up or find blame or come down on yourself hard. You know, you're trying to inquire so as to get yourself to a place that is a, a more reasonable, realistic, neutral state. You're trying to get to some clear thinking and not lost in something that's already happened that you can't undo. Um, or your, you know, your thoughts have run into a future that doesn't exist yet and you are afraid of potential scenarios and the fear of what that might be is gripping you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or taking that control back. Right. All right, so our next one would be like focusing on, again, what you can control, which uh -huh. is your internal world because the external world, you don't have control over that. Yeah. It's just, you know... People, events, things. As much as, as we, we try. Know, right, right. As we all know, shit's going to happen. And a lot of it is completely out of your control. So we have to remind ourselves to focus on what we can control. And that is our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own behaviors, our own attitudes, our mindsets. Those are all internal things, your internal world that we can control. And when you, because when you feel like you don't have any control, that's when, that's when fear really sets in. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to try to be solution oriented when you are in that kind of a state, when you feel like I have no control over anything anyway, but you do. And so bringing your focus back to your internal wo world and thinking about those things and just focusing on how you can be okay or better in the moment mentally, internally, then you are gonna be in a much more calm state and less uh, in a state of anxiety. And that is a more mentally strong place to be. Yeah, that's so empowering. Right. Yeah. And we don't want to, that's how we want to feel empowered. Feeling disempowered is a horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, the only time you want to feel disempowered, I think, is when you're looking for uh, like, like a extreme sports experience, or you're going to like ride that crazy ass roller coaster that, you know, that you've been afraid to get on forever because you're out of control. Then you're looking for the adventure, the thrill. There, there are times when you feel like you're just going to kind of give it up to whatever the thing is, and you're going to have that adventure, that variety in your life. There's a place for that, that type of uncertainty. But it isn't always necessarily when you are trying to navigate, um, you know, the things that are up for you right now that are maybe causing you stress and anxiety. So, so to be, to be in control of those, um, to be in control of what you're focusing on your mindset, that's a mental strength and that will serve you well, um, no matter how stormy the seas get. And that is a wrap for today, everybody. I hope you picked up some good reminders on how to become more mentally resilient and the importance of minding your mind. Please make sure to go back and listen to all of the episodes in their entirety as we do always share a lot of insight and tips to help you. Again, those were clips from episodes 94, 95, 112, and 115. 
All right, to find out what coaching is all about with me, just head on over to lauriebischoff.com where there will be lots of info for you and contact info, of course. Share this episode and help spread the good shift around. Please take a moment and give it a five-star rating and review us if you find value in the show because those reviews really help inspire other people to listen to all of the great shift being shared here. Until next week, stay feisty, my friends. Mind your mind and go make some epic shift happen in your lives. And you too, Gary Vee.